because that's actually how you differentiate. Those companies that have been very resilient over the past two years are also the companies that have been able to get their products to their customers and have been able to benefit from it and, and food from it. So that's an important element. Which brings me then to the second point is what's, what do you see then happening today in, in supply chains and what's, what's making them more resilient? Uh, one element is uh, first response to everybody is build up stock. So stock is being built throughout, throughout the, the supply chains. Second point, which uh, in Davos has been talked about a lot, is obviously making sure that you don't depend anymore on one delivery point, one source point for any uh, product that builds your products in the supply chain. Uh, whether you now call it China plus one, India plus one, whatever name you give it, it's all about making sure that you have several points uh, where a product could come from, so you have alternative supply chains, so that you're resilient to anything that can happen around the globe, uh, being it climate, uh, being it a health issue, or being it a war. So that's something that you clearly see happening at the moment. Now, how do you assure that that doesn't become a major cost issue? That comes down to, because you can easily do this by building lots of stock, having a very co complex supply chain, which will actually increase cost. But then it comes back to using data far better, uh, using data analytics far better, not only for us within the company or any company, but also throughout the supply chain, so that there's better sharing of data through the supply chain, so you can better optimize through the supply chain your stock level. So not everybody's going to build stock throughout the chain, but you actually start to optimize and communicate that through that. So I would say, uh, I'll, I'll stop here, can go on for another half hour, but I, mm. I think that's uh, both the learnings and from what I see that starts to happen and the learnings that our customers are taking at the moment. But mm. I'm just going to press you on one thing, which is that this world that you described on alternative, alternate supply chains, um, how does geopolitics play into it? It's not so easy to create alternate supply chains as we have seen over the last year. It is often political, geopolitical tensions or closing down or the erecting of barriers prevents that. And if and we're seeing well, more of that sort of brinkmanship. Yeah, but I would, I'd like to challenge you there. I don't think it prevents it. It's actually driving it at the moment mm -hmm. because, um, uh, because you need to have alternative sourcing points in your supply chain because you can no longer depend on one country of source. Because because of all the geopolitical political events, um, you have to you cannot depend. Uh, we've seen that in a uh, clear example in the automotive sector, uh, where lots of force came from that specific country that went into war, and then suddenly you needed to have alternatives yeah. for that. Now that's a big learning. You can't predict what's going to happen. The only thing that you know for sure is that you need to have a supply chain where you have alternatives, so that you can be resilient and actually respond fast to alternative to set up alternative channels. Paolo, how does resilience or does resilience risk being a Trojan horse for protectionism? Here in Davos this whole week, we've talked a lot about uh, the US, the Biden administration's IRA, and how many have said it's, it's essentially a protectionist act. Um, in particular, many, repeat, many Europeans have. So what is Europe doing to put companies in the best position that they can to be resilient? Uh, <clears throat> yes, well, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me, uh, what are we doing in Europe um, about something, resilience? I was asking myself and Alessandra uh, Galloni, how long has this term uh, <clears throat> been so popular, uh, resilience? Well, it always existed, but it is only since a few years. I think, obviously, that this is because resilience is a reaction to the crisis that we had, so the financial crisis and then the, the double black swan that we uh, had with the, the pandemic and the war. How is Europe reacting? Let me mention two or three things that are not uh, obvious uh, and quite new in, in Brussels. Um, first. Uh, giving, uh, well, the, the big program that we are using is called Recovery and Resilience Facility. So you know, you see the term is there. And it's the 800 billion uh, program of recovery of our economies. Um, the social dimension, the inequality dimension, um, the healthcare system dimension is very important in this program. This is the first thing. The second thing is uh, we are looking to uh, strategic autonomy, a taboo in the European Union until a few years ago. 
Um, at the point that when we had this discussion in, the, in Brussels, we concluded it with the term that was open strategic autonomy. So a sort of uh, Brussels oxymore for <laughs> what we were uh, meaning. Um, and of course, uh, strategic autonomy means not only and not mainly uh, defense, also defense, but supply chains and what we are talking about here. Um, we are working on this for the first time in, in the EU history. And third, the uh, future-oriented um, investments and industrial policies. Also, this to have common industrial policies uh, in some uh, strategic sector is completely new, would have been impossible. Uh, Mark, before Brexit would have been completely <laughs> impossible. Um, uh, of course, this means that not that we are delegating to the European commissioners the <laughs> industrial policies, uh, but that we are discussing with member states, with stakeholders, with the industries, uh, what are the main sectors where we are lagging behind, we have to catch up, and we have to put some common tools, both on state aid rules and on common funding. This is what we are working on. Let me only add one thing, uh, Alessandra. When I think to uh, this term, resilience, uh, and to how we reacted in a resilient way to the stress test of these uh, last three years, I think that first and foremost, resilience has been connected to democracy. Um, I think that a democratic model is a resilient model. And I think that this was very clearly demonstrated during this crisis. And it is still the case. So you can have lengthy decision-making process. You can have a lot of mess in our conversation. But at the end of the day, after these two big crises in a row, we see that democracy is stronger. So maybe it's a little bit of propaganda, but I don't think so. Keep in mind always that your society will be resilient if democracy will be your model. So this is an important point, um, uh, but, I, but, but we're, we're not going to deep, go deep into it. I mean, no, it no, has raised issues of democracy. But I want to press you just on one thing, though. This all sounds great. But how much, for example, of the next-gen EU funds have actually been applied? I mean, the criticism of corporate Europe vis-a-vis -vis Brussels, um, and even of some uh, you know, governments, is you know, there is so much, but mainly of corporate Europe, is there so much red tape? And, and it's just Europe is slow. And I was at a dinner last night at which a US, um, a, a, I will just say somebody from the US, because it was Chatham House, basically said, oh, you Europeans, you're, you're, all, you're complaining, but why don't you compete? You know? So you know, how much has actually been applied? And, and aren't European companies shackled by rules? I felt uh, like Mark wanted to answer that too. So, yeah, so Paolo and then Mark, yes. and then I want to go to Pamela, who's actually going to sort of give you reality. I would say yes and no. Uh, <laughs> yes, in general. And so among things that we have to change when we discuss on what we have to change to make uh, Europe more competitive is exactly what you're saying. Procedures, red tape, lengthy of our procedures on state aid, for example. Uh, if you refer to our uh, so-called uh, next generation EU recovery plan, uh, I think that a certain amount of um, uh, conditionality um, is absolutely needed uh, because it's the first experiment that we have of putting uh, money in common and we need to uh, make to all our citizens clear, and to government clear, that this money has been spent in the direction that we have agreed. So this is a burden for the administrations. I, didn't, I don't think so much in this case for the private sector. There are other burdens and red tapes for sure in Europe. And mostly there are the different regimes in different countries that are the burden for 
the private sector. The fact that you have, I, I don't know if 27, but a lot of different systems you have to adapt. And what we call the, the capital markets union, blah, 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 he is uh, moving. Uh, Slower than a snail. Bravo. Okay. So, okay, <coughs> but I was a serious question, how much of it has been applied? Do you have a percentage wise? Well, everything that was uh, planned until now has been applied. Can you give us a... a, a, a what? <laughs> I, no, no, I, uh, I think... You can think about it and we'll come no, back. No, no, I think it's uh, 138 billion um, until the end of last year. And this year uh, we are planning to uh, deliver expenditure for more than this. Pam, I'm coming to you in a second, but Mark, you look like you were about to. Uh, uh, yeah, I was a tell. As a um, European, you know, as a. As a European, I am a European, European. actually. Oh, I'm, you are? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh. I'm Irish citizen. Yeah, so oh, there you welcome. go. Welcome, welcome. Um, speaking as a European, um, <laughs> I like to say falling. Um, no, just a couple of th quick things. One is, look, from a sustainability perspective, climate perspective, I like this competition uh, because. Uh, you have the Repower EU is very powerful uh, set of measures already. Then we get the IRA. Now we're going to get, uh, taking President von der Leyen's uh, remarks here uh, from the other day, we're going to get a response, European response to that. So we kind of race for the top. So that's, that's all very positive. But I go back to something that Paolo said a moment ago about, uh, and, and it wasn't just, it, not so much the oxymoron, there's, there's something to open strategic autonomy. And let's just juxtapose open strategic autonomy and friendshoring, another popular term. So who are, the, who are the friends and in what sense is there the French Orient? And where can you rely? This is a fundamental question for resilience, is who can you rely under stress and how do you build out these, uh, build out these uh, models? And so I have no expectation that there's going to be any change in knowing the US legislative system to uh, uh, the IRA. And as I say, net-net, we're behind on climate, so it's a good thing because we'll get these responses probably in Canada, I would expect, as well. But it is a real issue in terms of determining how we build resilience across friends, after all, and I would say that uh, certainly uh, the EU and the United States are friends. Those are the Canadians. I'll throw the Canadians to the most Canadian. Pamela, I've sort of left you, left you um, last because I would like to sort of bring, bring it back after, after looking at companies and, and then you know, EU to sort of a more global picture, which is which countries globally do you think are the winners and losers of this shift between, of the shift mm -hmm. from efficiency to resilience? And does everything we've been talking about actually um, open the prospect of a shift in, in influence towards other countries uh, and away from, basically away from those that are the, the currently the big players and to others, and if so, how? Well, that wasn't in my notes, but okay. Mm. So well, I have a, I have a second question for you, which then leads us back into the other conversation. No, I, I just I was thinking about this whole resilience discussion, and I, um, I, let me just give you a preface. I come from an island state uh, which, that's been destroyed by hurricanes more than once, um, and so the concept of resilience for us is not theoretical, and it's not new. Uh, I think most developing countries live resilience every single day. It's, it's, you wake up, you have to be resilient, whether it is in the context of healthcare, whether it's in the context of exports, whether it's in the context of debt. Resilience is a sine qua non for what, what we do. And so, you know, I looked at the definition for resilience, the capacity to withstand or to recover dif quickly from difficulties, which is, I think, where the developed country world is, you know. We need to push back, we need to get back. Where I think we are, we're developing countries, is the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape, elasticity. And so that is the, the, the key issue. How elastic are we and how are we able to respond? And I think the, 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 the issue of you know, moving from um, the efficiency to resilience, I don't think the two are, are mutually exclusive. I don't think it should be seen as, as opposing poles. You know, I think that we need to re-examine how we determine what is economic success. Because I think the determination of economic su success as efficiency and competitiveness, etc., has led us to where we are. 
which is not looking at the sustainability of what we're doing and building resilience into that economic success, still being efficient, but also taking into account what are the other issues that will allow us to maintain this economic success, this efficiency, et cetera. So, you know, is it, is it a zero-sum game? No, it isn't. And I think the great opportunity we have here is building that capacity to make that switch or to make that transition to sustainability, to you know, meeting the EU due diligence requirements, um, looking at the IRA. How do you actually help developing countries to meet these new requirements and not be at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the green transition, et cetera? And then the second issue is, you know, is there going to be a shift of influence in terms of other countries? Yes and no. Yes, there will be, I, I think, the African continental free trade area is coming up. They're pushing a lot on, on onshoring, <laughs> reshoring, but getting uh, value addition and um, industrialization in Africa as opposed to extraction and leaving. So building sustainability into that and ensuring that it actually meets the long-term goals you know, for climate change, et cetera. Um, I'll stop there. Well, I wanted, uh, you yeah. often talk about, I and mean, one of the things we're trying to get to, I mean, in fact, as Mark said at the beginning, is sort of the nature of the response is the mm -hmm. words he used. You know, you often talk about, you talk about greening, digital, mm -hmm. and empowering women mm -hmm. as sort of three, yeah. Pillars, you know, so co costly, but not any more than would normally be, be done necessarily mm -hmm. as sort of call them quick wins. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so what is the one thing, therefore, that, that when the people on this panel go back and sort of go back to their, uh, you know, to their companies, to their constituencies, mm -hmm. and, you know, should, should do? Um, if I could wave a magic wand, which yes. only happens in the movies. Um, I think the, the, the main thing I would say to companies is this. You have many, 90% of the companies who supply to you are small. They're considered SMEs across the board within the supply chain. Help them actually become part of the decarbonization process. Help them meet the requirements because that increases not only their competitiveness, but the ability for them to actually expand their employment pool. It allows them to upskill. It allows them to actually you know, remain viable. So work with them as the lead firms for example, what um, AstraZeneca, what you did was incredible because it allowed developing countries to get AstraZeneca first when mm. everybody else had locked us out mm. in the Caribbean and elsewhere, AstraZeneca got there. Mm. And so these are the kinds of things that are important. In terms of governments, I think it's really important, and the EU has been doing a lot of work on this, in terms of building capacity of governments as well to... to, to change their policy framework to enable the kinds of green investment to enable us to meet the requirements. Because one of the other things is that, for example, um, in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, you know, over 4,500 farmers were decertified because of their inability to meet these requirements. And if that continues, then we're talking about another major stressor in terms of food security, et cetera. So I, I think that would be my first. Which are exemplary countries? You want me to? <laughs> I'm a UN employee. I can't. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Which are exemplary We're amongst countries? Friends. I, yeah. I would say, you know, the EU has been, and I'm not saying this because you're here, the, the EU has been really <laughs> open and, and very responsive to the need to do this. The Nordic countries have also been very responsive on this. And, and I think those are important issues. We've been talking with the US. Um, the US has been more inward looking for a while, but I think that there's also the, the recognition that there needs to be more engagement on the outside. Um, and of course, you know, the UK has been involved, uh, less so now, but uh, previously, on the issue of greening. Korea has also come in 
and is doing a lot more work with us on, on sustainability issues and so on. So I think that there is a recognition that there has to be this engagement because you're going to leave three quarter of the world behind and that won't be sustainable. I mean, Mark, what would your answer be as to, you know, who are the leaders? What countries can you call out as exemplary? Exemplary with respect, uh, the well, Pamela was talking specifically about greening, but that, which made me immediately pass it to you because obviously for your new role. But I think in general, as an example of of the of the world that that you sort of laid out at at the beginning. Yeah. Look, okay, I think that there is in the broad topic of resilience. Um, I would say the UK actually, I mean, funnily enough, the UK in certain areas, uh, in financial services, for example, I mean, the response after the crisis, not surprisingly, uh, has been there. I would caution that not to uh, repeat the mistakes of uh, finance over history, which is success as an orphan, and all of a sudden you do the right things that, and you forget about what the protections have been put in place and how that's helped you, so I would be a little careful in terms of uh, the evolution of that system, but, they, but the response, the UK response, including structural response on finance was leading, and also with respect to sustainability has been uh, one amongst mm -hmm. the leaders, I would say co with, uh, co with the EU, including last point, if I'm, I, because I want to hear from the others, but the, one of the important things with resilience is institutions, exactly. and so one of the value that the UK has and helped lead was is to have the Climate Change Commission, which basically marks the homework of the government in terms of the quality of the policy, shows the gap, and you get a response to that, which helps to build resilience. And we need to think about how we do that. I mean, a little commercial for the Bank of England, the Financial, uh, you know, the financial Policy Committee is an institution that sits there every day and thinks about resilience. Um, and that's an institution that helps on the, on the finance side. Leif, one thing that I wanted to ask you, I know you've been taking notes, so we have other things, but in the IRA, if I'm not mistaken, um, there is, um, for the first time, the federal government um, is negotiating directly on drugs uh, for, to cover older Americans, right? So um, basically, the U.S. government is going to negotiate uh, on prices on, on a select group of, of drugs. Um, and I'm wondering whether you think this is a turning point. And you say, well, how is this related? Well, because we've been talking a little bit about the interplay between public and private. So I'm wondering if you could maybe use this example, if sure. it's OK, to, <clears throat> to and tie it to what you were saying before about the need for pharmaceutical companies to be resilient. Yeah, I think you can say, um, f first of all, drug pricing is not a new issue in any way or form for the pharmaceutical industry in the US. It, it, it's, at any election time, <laughs> it's, it's been a big issue. And of course, one of the reasons is that the Americans actually have, altogether when you look at it from the outside, mm -hmm. a fairly inefficient system. It does provide the absolute best pharmaceutical products and treatment for certain parts of the population. But it does that with, with a fair amount of, if you want to call it bureaucracy or, or middlemen or whatever, uh, with that way. So I would say an unnecessarily costly system and much can be gained obviously by uh, negotiating with us but we are about 15 percent of the total health care cost the total health care cost is much much uh, bigger area and uh, that takes me a little into that uh, resilience I think uh, negotiating prices there is not a single country in the world that we don't negotiate prices in and there's not a single country in the world that don't say we would like to buy medicines uh, more cheaply um, so that we used to that that's sort of uh, that's the way it goes but as a consequence of, of the, the vaccine, you know, we, we were actually uh, building or making vaccines in 17 different countries around the world. And that what made it possible to go to a number of places that other companies could not go to. We probably had a request for 100 new factories from 100 new countries to build uh, vaccine factories. Now, that would not be a more resilient system. To, so to build 100 new factories for the next pandemic will not be a more resilient system than, than the one we have. Now, is it, is it a good, resilient aspect to say no vaccine factories in Africa? Absolutely not. Should be a couple. But there should not be 50, uh, and likewise out in Asia. So I think one area of resilience is a little of international cooperation, mm. to find ways where we can use regional hubs 
for critical resources. And, and vaccine is a good critical resource, but it's not the only one. You could look at it from many other parts of resource also and make sure that even in a crisis, uh, in, in a pandemic or, or another crisis, and we have climate crises ahead of us, I think we could identify them, some of them already, to be able to use at least regional resources in such a way. That actually requires international cooperation, international agreement, and agreements that can withstand uh, crisis. And that's an area where I think we are under-investing dramatically right now. One area that we haven't touched upon, and then I do think we have um, a couple, a few minutes for questions from the audience, but Oscar, I wanted to ask you, you talk about the redesign of supply chains, but one thing we haven't talked about is the workforce, right, and particularly aging workforces. Um, and, uh, you know, labor shortages, uh, you know, it's a key issue now. Um, how much can technology mitigate this, uh, this impact? And how are these inflationary uh, pressures exacerbating the challenge, essentially, of finding workers globally? Yeah, I think I think the, the whole to, and and keep it. I mean, this is a huge topic. There'd be a panel, yeah, exactly. but just I think we would be remiss if we didn't mention this. Is it? Yeah, I, th I think when we talk about the, the people, I mean, as you say, we could talk about you could have another another forum about that. Um, uh, but when we talk about uh, the resilience element of it, um, uh, what has proven to be very important is is to make sure that uh, we work on collaborative robotics, which is one uh, one thing which which has in a huge involvement, a huge uh, development um, uh, over the past period. Lots of investments gone in that direction, lots of very uh, affordable solutions. Uh, um, and specifically, if you pr approach it as a collaborative robotics approach, you mean that you make the work more interesting and more effective. Um, and, uh, it is actually uh, what Pete noticed is in all our facilities where we actually make those type of investments, the employee satisfaction ratio actually goes up uh, uh, and the retention rate uh, actually improves. So, so that's one element, but that obviously then comes because it also makes work more interesting, but it also makes sure that we then actually make, need to make sure we train people. You talked about aged, and make sure that we make sure we train people on the various age groups uh, to be able to actually make that journey together with us, uh, because that's a very important element uh, as well. And it's not rocket science, uh, but it is about making sure that we engage, make people own this, and therefore we stay, in, uh, stay part of that. So I think uh, uh, with the overall labor scarcity on the one hand and the other one, the, the, the aging of it, the more you keep the job interesting, the more you keep on investing in making the job more efficient and effective and more exciting, um, uh, uh, the more you can keep and grow people and keep them with you. Just Pamela, uh, did you want to add something on this? Because I saw you nodding vigorously. And then Paolo, <laughs> just quickly, very uh, synthesis on, on this. And then we'll ask, we'll, we'll just get a few questions from, from the audience. Uh, no, we were just, I was just nodding because of the, the need for the upskilling. The, the need for us to, as on another panel this morning, we were talking about the fact that, you know, within the next 10 years, the, well, five years, the amount of people who will be working in digital spaces versus machines is almost going to be equal, hmm. which means that we also have to change the way we approach the job market and how we train people and what we train them for and how do we help the job market make the transition. Yeah. So, yeah, and then on that, we make, we make very much specific p programs where we identify what the, mm -hmm. what the deltas are and, and right. what is trainable exactly. and for what do you need to have new people. And mm -hmm. a lot is actually trainable and it's yeah. the right investments to be made in, in the right. people we have. Yeah. Pablo? Not only to say that, the, of course, the labor market is a, a, a big issue now because we always say, and rightly so, that despite the crisis, despite inflation, despite everything, uh, the labor market is in, in overall in good condition. Mm -hmm. and employment is very low, uh, and even uh, job vacancies are, are, are there. Uh, but this uh, assessment should not hide the fact that uh, the, the, the problem of skilling and upskilling will be mm -hmm. uh, one of the key issues for resilience in the coming years. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And it is also connected for Europe to migration, of yes. course, because mm -hmm. uh, aging population, upskilling, migrants. Uh, you so always bring me to topics that could be... Uh, that could <laughs> no, be, no, uh, no, uh, no. <laughs> But the yes, world yes, is of connected. Yes. yes, the world is connected indeed. Okay, I'm going to take two questions, if you could, add, or, or uh, up to two questions. Um, go ahead. And then, sorry, just so they can prepare. And then I'd like to do a real lightning round to end, and um, just to, to wrap up your thoughts. But maybe one 
if you can think of one word, what is one synonym of resilience that, that you think is, um, is really, uh, you know, uh, that you would use um, uh, to, to really think about what it, what it means? Um, uh, I, I work with words, so I always. <laughs> one word. <right? laughs> one word, one word, okay. Uh, hi, Mehreen Khan from The Times. I have a question for Mr. Carney and for the Commissioner. Um, Mr. Carney, you were quite sanguine about the prospect of having uh, maybe a subsidies raised for green tech um, with the EU responding to the IRA, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, are you not worried about some of the downsides, particularly if countries are giving carte blanche to spray money uh, at sectors just to compete with what other jurisdictions are doing and maybe not reaping the benefits of the overall falling cost that should come from the IRA for everyone else? And, and the UK has stood on the sidelines of this debate probably because it doesn't have the fiscal room. Um, would you encourage them to get involved? Uh, and then a question for the Commissioner. Um, does, does, is joint borrowing a prerequisite to have um, a, a common uh, and effective response? And if I suspect your answer will be yes, why is the answer yes, given that the EU has actually given quite indirect benefits to lots of industries in the form of free carbon credits for a long time? Um, we have an ETS system which generates quite lucrative revenues for governments. That is money that should be used uh, and should probably have been used in hindsight to help this greening process and hasn't. So um, is there just a lot of money sloshing around which could be used uh, in the subsidies area that doesn't necessarily require uh, RRF 2.0? Gosh, somebody who speaks faster than I do. I mean, mm -hmm. It was okay. impressive. Mark. Uh, a couple of things. I, I, I'm not fully going to accept your characterization of uh, fiscal uh, spending. Um, look, there are certain technologies, uh, hydrogen, uh, carbon capture and storage, uh, the build out of uh, uh, charging uh, infrastructure, uh, which are, I would suggest, uh, well, certainly mission critical for uh, addressing climate change, but fundamental building blocks, at least on the first two, of competitiveness, industrial competitiveness uh, for major economies. Um, at this stage, up until the IRA, uh, repower EU, a few other measures, uh, the um, incentives, the carrots and stick combination for those technologies were not yet adequate, given the timelines with which they have to come forward. We're now getting into the zone where that is happening and it has material consequences, positive consequences, in pulling forward the crossover dates for these, uh, uh, for, for these technologies to become uh, competitive uh, and therefore these economies to become more resilient. So I, I, I think there's much to commend about both Repower EU to look at that um, and, um, and the IRA and uh, I'll run out of time so I'll just say that uh, there's much to commend the many of the aspects of UK climate policy as well. Well, I'm, I agree on the fact that these measures are overall positive. Also, the IRA has a very positive yeah. aspect, yeah. which is strengthening the green, uh, the greening of the American economy. Uh, what we have not to forget is that this crisis has an asymmetric impact mm -hmm. in the economies of exactly. uh, advanced areas. So Europe is more affected than U.S. Mm -hmm. or Canada or Japan, and the emerging markets are much more affected than Europe. So it's not like COVID that was a um, symmetric crisis in all over the world. And this is why we have to work on competitiveness, not with an RRF2. I, I agree with your skepticism. We have to implement RRF, which is already a big, big thing, but identifying the missions, the targets, where the scale and the added value to support things at European dimension is crucial. It's not everything. Um, I'm not saying that national support schemes are useless, but if we want to catch up in some sectors where we are lagging behind, we need the scale of a market with 450 million people and we need to concentrate also resources. But it's not a new RRF. Great. Not this dimension. Not I'm going to close it here. Just last, um, I'm going to use this as your last remark, resilience. What, what, what's the word that's a word or thing that comes to mind when you think resilience? One word. Democracy. Democracy. Survival. Survival. And did you have any closing remarks? That oh, you no. Want? I just think Survival. We Excellent. Officer? Opportunity. Opportunity. Mark? Uh, robust. 
I would say science and technology. There is such a wave of new science coming our way, genetics, immune system, uh, everything that has to do uh, with genes uh, and cells that can be translated into really good medicines for the future and help alleviate healthcare costs. No science is your word then. All right, thank you everyone. We've run out of time. Thank you so much thank to, you. to uh, my panelists. Uh, really Grazie. Grazie. Okay.